Hello and welcome to Cybersecurity File Drills, Incident Response Plans and What Comes Next. This is something that uh, unfortunately uh, every organization needs to deal with. So this is not the fun topic and the exciting topic, but it is a very important topic relative to uh, preparing and uh, your organization to handle when that bad day comes. Because statistically speaking, uh, you've probably already had a bad day uh, in this regard, and this will hopefully prevent you from having uh, 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 that bad day go worse. Uh, so thank you all very much for joining. My name is Nate Austin. I'll be uh, facilitating uh, some of the conversation, but James Mo uh, is going to be uh, leading the conversation and Stephanie is also going to be behind the scenes in the Q&A. Uh, quickly for some housekeeping, please use the Q&A panel for any questions. Uh, and anytime you have a question, pop it in there. We're either going to answer it offline, but we're going to let James go through the presentation uh, and the content, and then we'll most likely answer most of those questions at the end if we're not able to interject them in the session. So let's talk about some quick takes. We always like to hit on what are the most important things that you're going to get out of this, this session. First of all, let's understand what is an incident response plan. Uh, that is very important. Uh, uh, what can go wrong? What can go right? Why do you want to have one of these? That's what James is going to go through today. And then uh, we also have a session. And I'm going to I'm going to plant the seed multiple times. Uh, we'll talk about it at the end as well. But we have workshops uh, next month in October of 2022. For those of you who might be listening to this, uh, the recording uh, to help in both Colorado and Minnesota, where you can come and build your own plan. Can actually come and you'll walk away with at least a framework of a plan that you could you could start using or or iterating or improving so uh, that's the next steps but today we're going to leave it up to james to kind of walk us through uh, what is an incident response plan and some of the strong reasons to have them and the benefits of having them uh before we get into all the content i always like to hit about one minute about my tech we are a small medium business technology consulting organization. Uh, we have learned over the 22 years we've been in business uh, that we have a proven IT strategy. It's not the only IT strategy, but it is a proven one that we know delivers consistent, re reliable results for our clients. It removes our IT challenges. It reduces the amount of time that their team is spending on IT problems, ultimately so you can focus on serving your customers better and be more adaptable to business challenges. All this together working uh, with us and our clients, uh, they achieve four times more value and productivity from their IT investments. I know that's not why you're here today, uh, so we'll move on. But if that is something you'd like to raise your hand and talk about, we'd love to have that conversation. Please let us know. But without further ado, James, let's take it away and talk about cybersecurity fire drills. What do we need to learn today? Well, we want to learn about the pieces of the instant response and how you build one. You're going to Everybody's busy. Do I really need to have one of these? Things to consider while you're putting together. Uh, you can Google templates. Not saying you shouldn't do that, but you might want to understand why you're doing it. And we, of course, want to be available to answer any questions you might have as you go through this process. I wanted to start by kind of going through this. One of the advantages that we have uh, is, you know, in the seats that we sit with our so many of our clients, is we see how this plays out in real world. And if you haven't gone through this, maybe I can talk to you a little bit about what it can be like both with and without a plan. Uh, it is kind of a bad day. Uh, there's a sinking feeling. I've heard that comment to me before as I realize when we're telling them something, uh, we're gonna assume you own some sort of regulated data or some sort of thing that is of concern to you or to somebody else. Uh, usually this is something like a, a personal health information or privacy information, financial information. And, you know, let's pretend you're just sitting there and then the phone rings and it's IT, whether it's my tech or another provider or in-house person, and they talk to you, uh, we think somebody's in so-and-so's mailbox. That means they've probably taken whatever's in there. And then everybody starts looking at you about what are you supposed to do about that? And you just kind of sit there. Now, if you don't have a plan, they're still looking at you. They don't know what to do. They won't do until you probably are saying something about it. So everybody starts doing things and maybe you call somebody. Uh, maybe I'll call my insurance agent because I don't know what to do next, but he's golfing or not answering or you got the wrong number or whatever. Um, maybe you tell IT, IT, hey, we got to fix this quick change everybody's passwords and IT runs around and maybe half of your team is locked out of the system now. That's happened before. Um, Tell marketing maybe that you need to tell everybody to get the message out that we're going to be slow to respond because we've been breached. Well, now everybody, internal and external, is really freaking out, and your lawyers are kind of grimacing because you've used legal terminology, maybe ways that you shouldn't. The upshot is, you know, three, we've even said as long as five days before you get started on a low quality response. You're not going to have any answers. People are going to be asking you things. You won't know what's going on. 
uh, you're going to feel bad for a while. That's what we don't want, right? With a plan, I mean, it's not saying that this is guaranteed going to happen, but what we're trying to do is let everybody know what to do. They start working. They've told you they're doing their part. You're doing your part. People are notifying the right way to get your cybersecurity insurance involved. You get breach counsel assigned. who's coaching you through it. Your IT team has already gone through a containment action. They know what to do. They're coordinating with a specialist to come in and help uh, you know, stop the bleeding, so to speak. Your PR teams have crafted the right messaging. Your staff are not panicking. Your clients are, are not ready to leave you. Everybody's understanding that things are happening, but nobody's upset or angry or anxious about it. And you get your risk understood and you know what's going on within you know eight hours, maybe, maybe even sooner. This is a high quality response that answers a bunch of questions that allows you to continue working your business, serving the mission of your organization. That's what you're trying to do. Yeah, Nate, what's going on? Hey, J yeah, James, I, I think I, I hear this and I, you know, I feel like uh, I remember a, uh, some a story you told me where um, uh, a client that we had to work with that did not have a plan and they had to get their insurance involved and there was a significant delay because there wasn't this plan built. And it wasn't even 100% their fault. It was also because their cyber insurance wasn't ready. So, uh, and that delay was, I mean, could, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that a little bit, because this is a real world example of yeah. what can happen without a plan that can have a dramatic impact on your organization. Thursday morning, in this case, uh, I was working with the, the IT group and the client, and it was Tuesday late afternoon before any actual response efforts were taken. Now, it's not to say that we didn't, start doing any sort of containment but the the client in this case had no answers in a potentially uh, uh regulated industry with a mandated notification that could be damaging to their business five plus days including a long weekend without knowing any solid answers or what they were going to do next so uh it's not where we want our people to be uh we want them yeah, to like, have it's like it's like letting a fire burn for five days, right? I mean, like you yeah. want to get containment on that fire right away. And th th basically because of the lack of um, uh, planning and collaboration, uh, even though they did have cyber liability insurance, which is a positive, it actually created, um, you know, without that plan, it created this delay that, you know, they were at this risky spot. And again, like James said, there was some mitigation that had happened, but it's still due to the forensic nature of what uh, uh, you want to be able to do, there, you're limited to what you can do without proper authorization yeah. to get the right people involved. And so that's that's a real world example of not having a plan versus having a plan um, uh, of what that time could mean to you. Even if you're trying to act, you're you're in a holding pattern. So yeah. anyway, sorry, James, I just, that, no, that was something I feel fine. that was impactful to me. I remember when you told that story and I thought that would be worth sharing. Yeah, it, it certainly is. And one of the things that we like to, to talk about as we're talking about fire drills and, and how that works is we, a fire drill is functionally, you already can maybe pass your annual fire inspection. You, to use that analogy, your building probably has modern protections that are going to keep you safe in a fire most likely. But what a drill is addressing is that those controls that limit a fire, you know, being dangerous and scary, they aren't perfect. We live in an imperfect world where controls don't work 100% of the time and you have to know what to do when they fail. So in the case of a fire, a fire does manage to break out and all your extinguishing and prevention mechanisms don't work, your, your staff need to know how to evacuate your facility. In the same way with your cybersecurity controls, they're not enough on their own. They're, they're going to be cases where something happens, some, may, some crazy a uh, thing is going to happen that you couldn't anticipate and there will be an event that turns into something bad. You need to know what to do. And the best way to know what to do is, is to talk about it, plan it ahead of time and practice it. Uh, and that's what we want to get to here. And, and maybe you've been in business for many, many years. Uh, and why now do I need this? We tried to build a little bit of, of context here. Um, the quote at the top is a person works at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, Dr. Ron Ross, but the quote is pretty universal. You almost could just say that and no one would probably disagree with you that every one of us is working in an organization that probably needs technology in some way, shape or form. And if you need that technology to be there for your mission, for your business, for your uh, ongoing uh, operations, you have to make sure it stays running. You have to make sure that any risk to that technology is managed. And this is only gonna get stronger required as, as like most compliance regimes, regulation regimes, anything about privacy or, or personal information or um, any sort of controlled data, 
they will start making you pay lots of attention to this. And if you want to work with people who work with that data, they're going to want you to do this. And it's just going to keep getting stronger and stronger, stricter and stricter. And again, if something will happen someday, if that's what we believe, and that's generally true, that not, nothing is perfect forever, you want to know what to do in that day. You want to take an approach that's formalized, that's focused and coordinated. That's what we're going for here. That lets you Everybody's standard on the same thing. You do the same way and you're all working in the same direction. And eight. The only other thing I'd say, James, that uh, and it, you, you're alluding to it, it in this way, but uh, we, we've also seen is that because uh, uh, insurance providers uh, saw uh, li cyber liability as this cash, uh, this big cash flow of saying, hey, there's this new way we can charge more premiums and get but there was very little underwriting because there's very little understanding of the industry. Well, guess what? Uh, in the last several years, that has changed. There's been so much uh, uh, bad things that have happened and payouts that happen on those policies that the cyber liability insurance providers are actually locking this stuff down. And some of them are actually prescribing how you need to handle uh, these situations to help help you mitigate the risk best and adhere to the policy paying out. And so that's one of the things that we've seen in particular in the last uh, 18, 24 months probably, yeah. where um, where cyber liability insurance providers are rationing up the underwriting. So that's, you've probably all experienced that. If you go talk to them and ask them, what are my requirements to be eligible to either renew or get a policy, you'll see higher requirements. Uh, and, and some of them, and I, we imagine that in the future, most of them, uh, if not all of them, are going to require uh, that you can't use your either internal team or your outsourced uh, IT provider. Like if it's my tech, for example, they will man, they will prescribe that you can't use my tech. Um, you'll have to use somebody else. And so figuring that out, building that plan and not trying to figure out who that somebody else is uh, or if that's what your cyber liability policy uh, requires, but you're not trying to figure all that out um, when that bad day happens. Um, so it's, 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 it's not just your plan, it's also collaborating with folks like us and or your cyber liability yeah. policy to figure out the right way to approach this. So that's also something that is changed in the last like really 12 to 24 months, which is, as James, I appreciate you saying that like you may be in business a long time and never really had to deal with this. Well, these are the things that are changing in our world right now that are, that are kind of warranting the small business response, so. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the formality of, of having your plan means you can share it with your insurance provider. You can get on the same page with them and ensure that it is the way you will do this. And yes, it will definitely, your claims will be approved. You won't have any, any pain and suffering down the road. Um, cybersecurity incidents, most of us understand clearly what that's going to mean. Like we're talking, you know, attempts to gate access to things, denial of service. You, you hear these terminologies. I've listed some examples of what that would look like. So in the case of like you show up to work and suddenly you can't get to a, a system that you normally use, or maybe you find out somebody has been cooking the books on you, or, oh my gosh, you might have lost personal data. And any of these situations can often lead a business leader to kind of have that cold sinking feeling in the bottom of their stomach. This is what we're trying to address. And it doesn't have to just be one of these at a time. Like basically all those together are kind of what ransomware does to you, right? But you want to have some method of a proceeding here. We're talking about any anything that's going to threaten or actually damage uh, or alter or disclose any of your data. That's what we're trying to, to build around uh, something to handle this. You might have response or incident um, response procedures, especially in like health and human safety or um, physical safety like fire drills. But we want to make sure that we're specifically calling out the, the special needs and concerns for the cybersecurity, the informational uh ones so uh what do we want to put in here so all these plans functionally we're thinking about a business plan is it's who is going to do what how are they going to do it and by when right like if we really just make this really down to the brass tacks here if you have nothing um that's what you want to start figuring out ahead of time in the event that one of those things that i was talking about a, you know a system's down a ransomware or whatever who is going to do what? A lot of times the clients we work with are just gonna be like, um, you guys are gonna do all of it, right? I mean, hey, we're good, but we can't do everything. You're gonna need to talk to some other people and you're gonna need to have some other resources. And that's what we wanna get into here too. And you wanna give them some, some structure of how you want them to proceed on that and some sort of idea of the timing of what it would take. The other way you can think about plan is if you think of like the stages of how we're all collectively gonna to move towards a common goal. 
So the parts that I would say you want to be looking at here, you'll you'll see in if you Google Instant Response Plan or whatever, you're going to pull up in your search engine of your choice. Uh, usually, you're going to see a bunch of flow charts with a bunch of structures in it. We'll talk about that a little bit. That's a response structure. That's a model that you would use to drive this plan. But you also are going to want to see some things about roles and responsibilities, the people that who you want to get the resources that they're going to need that you have that ready to serve in this capacity, how you want them to communicate measurements that you want to have because it's expensive to be in this mode and you want to make sure that you're doing the right thing with this investment. And then whatever requirements you might have for documenting or reporting this information. And you want to also have an expectation on how you're going to come back afterwards and figure out how it went. Did this go correctly? Is this something where uh, we need to shore it up? You want to have that built into your response. The, resp the model, the response plan structure, I don't want to dwell too much here. This is where most IR discussions, IRP incident response plan discussions are going to go. It's important to have a framework to work within. I'm not saying it isn't. If I'm taking the assumption a lot of us listening to this right now don't have a plan, or if they have one, they've never looked at it, um, don't get hung up in this. This is something you want to get to and use as you mature. Uh, there's a couple of models. Pick one. This one is from the NIST uh, framework. It's fairly simple for non-technical people, in my opinion, to follow along with. And it helps you like build those common phases of how you're going to get there together. But I wouldn't get too hung up in the nuts and bolts of this. You do you want to flow through this and you want to mature into this, but I'm going to move past this because I think what you really want to get into, if you have starting from nothing, is to get down the names, get that who defined, right? Who's going to do what? Name the people. I, I, I can tell you if you just put it in there, it's going to be like the front desk person or the person in here. You want to actually say it's Jane, it's Jim, it's whoever. That's who you want to put in there. This is the role that they have. There's going to be a lot of things that you're going to want to spell out, but you kind of want to put, we put some examples of some in here because we don't want to get too bogged down in all the details of all these sections right now, but think through like who's going to be in charge, who's going to actually do the work to respond, who's going to activate your insurance, who's going to make sure that the bank accounts are secured, who's going to notify, who's gonna, like, think through logically what you would want happening. Um, write the names, right? That's kind of the, the core of the, what we weren't telling you here. Get the names down. Identify the resources next that they have to work with. If you have a cyber insurance policy, excellent. Make sure that you know and you document how you activate that policy. It is not just a free tip. It is probably not calling your insurance agent. That is probably not the best way to activate it. In fact, the cyber insurance policy will most likely have a phone number or activation process that they want you to go through. Understand what that is. Capture it in this plan. Make sure that it's not just buried in the one electronic copy of the policy that's buried in somebody's files that are now on the machine that is ransomware, right? That's not ideal. Um, maybe you need to have law enforcement or emergency response or your lawyers or whoever. Label the resources you have available so that in the moment when the stress is on and everybody's kind of worried, they have a clear path of these are the resources that we have. You want to define how do you expect to communicate? It's fairly obvious, isn't it? I'm going to call them or I'm going to email them or I'm going to use our chat method. We use Teams here at MyTex. We like Microsoft 365. What if the email team's cell phone is compromised? Who's listening to that? Um, have some backup information. Have some personal email. Have the, have the, if this doesn't work, we will go to this method in this way. So everybody understands and nobody's uh, not answering their personal cell phone because uh, they did not have the expectation you would be calling it in a critical situation. Define those things ahead of time. Make sure everybody's on board and keep those things current. Uh, the next thing that we want to talk about is how you measure this. So if this is a very expensive and it is process, both in terms of what it could cost you from the outlay, but also the time that you're investing in this, all these expensive people, you're talking about cyber forensics and response and lawyers and it's a lot. You want to understand how you got here, how efficient were you, and how you can limit coming back, right? Categorize what's going on. Are you getting an incidents because of your email, or incidents because of your uh, physical insecurity of your building, because of your laptops being stolen out of your employees' cars? Like, what can you do about that? If you don't know that it's happening, you can't track it, you're not going to really 
know how effective you are in preventing or moving through it. And did you need to call the lawyer? Uh, we will never say don't call the lawyer, by the way. Always call your lawyer. Talk to your lawyers. They're our friends. They're also our expensive friends. So if you don't need to talk to the lawyer, maybe don't. But if you did when you didn't need to, you want to be able to track that, right? Um, also, we want to, you know, moving on to get standards for what you need to collect if you're under some sort of obligation legally to protect certain data in certain ways. You need to document how you proceed with that. You may need to collect evidence for getting to the insurance company later. You might need to mandate certain things to protect certain areas, who you're going to consult, when you're going to consult, get this firm involved. You know, these are the things you can do. These are things you can't do, right? And under these conditions, we must send a report to the government or whoever about this incident. You need to spell that out so that always assume that A, common sense won't work because people are stressed and B, you might not be there to do this work. You might be in the middle of something, right? Maybe the incident is like something that took you out of commission for whatever reason. You're in Honduras or something with no cell phone service on your vacation. Here you go. Your team's got to solve this without you. You want to spell all this out for them in this document so that you have a business to come back to. We would say that probably the most important thing you can do is learn your lessons when it's all done. At the end of this, after the fact, not in the heat of the moment, Come back together. Take those metrics that you document in the measurement. Take the reports and the documentation that you get. To walk through the process of when and how this went down. Can you do anything better? Could we make it a more efficient process? Could we do any more for prevention? Um, seek to understand what happened and can we address it? Don't try and blame and fire people over this. I mean, that's the natural tendency, but let the tempers cool. Is there anything we can do better that might preserve this and limit us going back into this down the road? Okay, there's a lot of elements to put into there. Once you have one, what do you, how do you use it? There's kind of three things I want to really focus on here. You need to keep this available, you keep it up to date, and you need to make sure everyone understands how to use it. So when you talk about accessibility for these things, you know, most of the time people have a document and they put it in the network drive or the SharePoint or the whatever, and nobody knows where it is, right? Nobody can go find it. Nobody knows how to open it. Nobody knows if they should, um, or maybe they put it somewhere that then is lost or damaged in the event that we're responding to. Um, as much as I am not a paper printing sort of person, if I was gonna print anything, literally anything, this would probably be it. And copies, not copy, because you will probably want more than one. And you probably want them in places that are not in the physical space that you are working in from a daily uh, perspective. Have it ready when you need it and have it current, right? When we talk about governance, that's a big fancy IT security word that basically is trying to talk about, are you building enough structure to allow the program to be successful? Have you built in things that allow you to keep it current? You've got a regular group that's pulling it out, making sure it's accurate, making sure it works, making sure that it will be sufficient for you when the time comes and you need to use it. Are you spending enough time and energy, your due diligence in the terminology of the, of the cybersecurity world, making this a useful part of your business? Or on the flip side, are you establishing negligence by having a thing and then not touching it for three years? That's not a, 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 an evidence of an established mature program. That's sort of the evidence of the opposite. You don't want that. Uh, you also want to train the people in your organization, both the responding people. Obviously, this is how I want you to respond to this. But even if, the, if not the act of responding, the leaders within the organization that know how to activate it. What's supposed to happen while it's being activated? what their roles are, how do they participate, even if they may not be the named people. And I would say run through it. One of the things you like to do is just pull the thing out and play the what if game. So if I was to kind of wrap a lot of this up, you want to pull that team together. Who's your team? Who's the who? Who are their names, right? The leaders of your the, the, the personnel, the people who are going to respond to it, what ex external resources you have, who's on your side when this goes on? That's your kind of core starting point, right? From there, you want to keep this thing current. It doesn't help if you list a person who left six months ago on your plan, right? Like if it's somebody important to your organization, it's named in the plan and they depart your organization, they need a replacement name on there so that when you come out to pull it, you're not trying to figure out in the moment who's supposed to do this now and that that person understands what they're supposed to do. Um, get it out, check it, keep it updated, keep it current. Practice what's on it, right? Play the what if game. Just sit down over lunch. 
hey, what if our email services dropped for an hour, for a day, for a week? What would happen? How do we do that? What are we supposed to do? Talk through it just, and as you talk, take some notes. I guarantee you'll find things you want to do back to change that plan. Train up the staff on what they should do to notify it, participate in it, where to get it, all those pieces. Make sure everyone understands how to use this thing. And then take that lessons learned step seriously. Go back to look at what happened, make the improvements, make the changes, assess whether or not you need to do more than that. Uh, really take some time to adopt you know, your, uh, your take on how to make this thing better because nobody wants to live here. So this is our, our, our way to keep it one bad day for as little as possible and not a series of bad days over time. So that functionally is what I would take you for now. There's obviously so much more we want to do. I love to work with people more deeply on this and get into a more um, hands-on workshopping of this. But uh, luckily you have an opportunity for that, right, Nate? You do, yeah, thanks, nice nice segue, James. So uh, we wanted to tee this up to just uh, introduce the concept of incident response plans and some of the why around what we're seeing in the industry. Again, we're not, uh, as we were working even with our internal team uh, on our processes to make sure that we are ready to align to our clients' processes, uh, this is something that we're trying to say, look, this is something that's happening to all of us. Uh, the security world is becoming more complex and requiring this. And uh, the, the insurance world is becoming more complex and requiring this. And so in order to be able to mitigate these risks, this is the stuff that we all need to start iterating and evolving and maturing and improving. So uh, that's why we introduced this topic today. That's why it's recorded. Uh, and we are going to be hosting a, a, a Build Your Incident Response Plan workshop. Stephanie's posting those in the Q&A. We have two sessions coming up for those that are listening right now or watching in the future. Uh, if, you, if you happen to catch it before October 5th in Minnesota, uh, it's a 90-minute session and October 12th in Colorado. These are in-person events. Uh, we will be walking you through it, going in depth in greater detail uh, to, I mean, these could be full day events, candidly, so we're not gonna do that, but we're gonna walk you in more detail than what we did today to help you build out and build out that framework for your plan. So those are coming up. Uh, so uh, again, those those posts, uh, those, those links are there in the Q&A and we'll send them as a follow-up email as well. Uh, so James, go on to the next um, slide. So that's our big call, the action or recommendation. If this is something of interest to you, those are some things that you can do. Those sessions are free, by the way. Uh, so just there's no there's no cost associated with those. Um, but in the future, like we, we post things like this to our YouTube channel. So we'd love it if you either follow us on LinkedIn or YouTube. We always keep this stuff up to date on those on those uh, medias, mediums. Um, share any of these events with others. Like if you feel there's other people that you know in your community or business colleagues that could benefit from this, it's why we do this stuff for free is we want to get this stuff out there. We feel like these are the things that we can do to help contribute to uh, businesses being successful and mitigating the risks that exist. Um, again, we have the uh, incident response plan workshops that are coming up. Those are on our website as well as the links here. And then uh, we also have power user groups. Those are something we're going to be continuing into next year. So stay tuned for those. But we really want to help uh, folks like yourself and organizations like yours to self-serve and uh, learn how to iterate and prove how they use Microsoft 365 uh, capabilities. So that's what the power user groups are about. So uh, as we're just wrapping up, I want to say thanks everyone for attending or watching live. We are going to open it up for some Q&A. Uh, but I want to say thanks, James, for walking us through that. And uh, we are at the 1.30 time. For those of you who need to drop off, thanks for joining us for 30 minutes. Uh, if there are uh, those who want to stick around, we're going to be opening up for Q&A.